This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, broadcasting remotely. Connecticut's economy has reopened, but does that mean you can go back to your job? There are still plenty of residents who are unemployed. And next month, a federal benefit that supplemented unemployment payments to them and millions of Americans will end, unless Congress acts. Today, where we live, we consider the workers who are still on unemployment or who are still waiting for their claims to be processed. Are you one of them? You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or you can find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Coming up, we'll learn how employers in our state are handling their changing workforce needs. Joining us will be Mark Seutcher, who is the Human Resources Counsel for the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. And we'll also hear from a fellow at the Brookings Institution who breaks down the argument that unemployment insurance, quote, discourages work. If that sounds familiar, it's something Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont said last week, as reported by the Connecticut Mirror. Now, we invited Governor Lamont to come onto the show today, but he declined. We hope to have him back soon. Joining us now on the phone is Greg Ladke. He's a reporter for the Connecticut Mirror. Greg, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me on. As I mentioned, uh, many Americans are getting a portion of their regular wages from unemployment insurance during the pandemic, and also this special federal benefit of $600 a week to supplement these insurance payments under the CARES Act. Uh, I referenced uh, Governor Lamont recently taking a position that these federal benefits um, aren't something that need to continue. It's something that congressional Republicans have also, have also said. What can you tell us about that event and who was Governor, Governor Lamont talking to? Uh, the governor was at a, uh, uh, testing, a new testing site in New Britain uh, for the COVID crisis. <clears throat> but uh, the issue of the $600 uh, a week federal supplement uh, for unemployment insurance uh, came up during questions and answers with reporters. Um, and what he said was uh, that he isn't in favor of continuing that $600 a week uh, um, addition to for, for the unemployed. Uh, he said it sometimes discourages work. Um, the idea being that uh, people who are getting that supplement in addition to state unemployment benefits uh, may not want to go back because they're getting more money than they would at a minimum wage job. Um, that puts in much more in line with Republicans in Congress than it does with uh, Connecticut's con- congressional delegation, which is all Democratic, as Lamont, it's Lamont's party. And uh, so it sounded rather different from what you would expect from a so-called liberal Democratic governor in a liberal Democratic state. Mm. Uh, why would Governor Lamont take that position? Is it because he's from uh, the business background, Greg? I think that's. I really think that's part of it. Um, <clears throat> you think he's a uh, Lamont is a Greenwich uh, millionaire, multimillionaire. Um, he's been in business before uh, he turned to politics. Um, he has a rather cons- more conservative uh, approach to fiscal issues. And he is, at this point, totally focused on getting the uh, Connecticut economy back open uh, in this COVID crisis. And a big issue there is whether or not a lot of these workers who are now on on unemployment will risk going back to work. And I think that's what's playing uh, more in his mind at this point. Um, Mm -hmm. His focus is on getting the economy restarted. And if too many people don't want to go back to work because of their concerns over the coronavirus uh, or worries about their family, uh, that that could slow things down. So I think that's where he's coming from. Now, Governor Lamont has uh, endorsed this idea of, I guess, guess giving workers a stipend to entice them back. What can you tell us? Well, the Republicans in Congress and the White House as well is is pushing this $450 uh, return to work stipend, excuse me, which would be a one-shot payment to somebody who was on unemployment and returns to work. The problem that some economists have with that is that it it is a one-shot, one-time-only deal. And if you're a uh, person who is going from unemployment back to a minimum wage job, you're going to use that $450 immediately. 
but after it's gone, it's gone, and you will be back in your situation where uh, you may not you be scraping to pay your rent, to buy enough food, to buy clothes for your kids. That is why there's a, a push in part for this six, ongoing $600 a week federal unemployment benefit. Um, the theory is that that will pump a lot more money into the economy than just a, a one-time $450 stipend. You're hearing Greg Latke here on Where We Live. He's a reporter for the Connecticut Mirror. As we talk about unemployment insurance uh, during the pandemic, again, this federal supplemental uh, benefit that was passed under the CARES Act by Congress, uh, giving uh, people that are unemployed an extra $600 a week, that benefit will end at the end of July. Uh, Coming up, we're going to learn more about that specific benefit and also what workers and employers are facing uh, because of this extended unemployment insurance program. If you're benefiting from this program, you can join our conversation, 888-720-9677. Are you dependent on that extra $600 a week? And if the benefit goes away at the end of July, where does that leave you? Again, we want to hear from you. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Uh, You talked with UConn economist Stephen Lanza. What else did he tell you about this proposal from Governor Lamont? And again, how this extension is impacting Connecticut residents. Who are these workers? Workers specifically, Greg? A lot of them are um, minority workers. They're lower income workers. They're people who worked in the uh, casinos and the, uh, you know, tourist attractions, uh, uh, small businesses. They're, they're very much the, the biggest impact uh, has been for those people in the economy. I mean, the middle, middle class people were laid off in, in large numbers as well. But the biggest impact and the, and the hardest hit are uh, minority and lower income uh, workers uh, of all ethnicities. We're hearing from Jim on Twitter who writes, most freelancers only get $600 a week. This is a huge mistake by Ned to sacrifice a supportive community that has no place to work until venues open. Uh, Greg, what do you think about that comment? And what has been the reaction, again, uh, since Governor Lamont uh, came out with this statement, again, siding with congressional Republicans about this federal benefit? Yeah, he was clearly on the uh, on the other side of the, the issue from uh, Democrats like uh, U.S. Rep. Uh, Rosa DeLauro from New Haven. Um, she flatly said, you know, this is a very important thing for lower income people, for the economy. Um, so he is in this, in this issue, on this issue, he uh, seems to be separating himself from, from the bulk of the Democratic Party in Connecticut, which is very uh, on the liberal side of the, of the political spectrum. Um, Stephen Lanza at UConn, he's an economist at UConn, uh, is pointing out that the federal government has not done all that much to uh, to stimulate the economy. And his point being is, again, this $600 a week uh, federal benefit is going to go back into the economy immediately. The people who are getting it are not going to hang on to it and put it in their bank accounts. And there's been a lot of talk about uh, corporations uh, that have benefited from all the uh, pandemic support that Congress has passed, and that they're st- socking a lot of people are socking this money away. The, the folks who are on unemployment and getting this $600 a week uh, uh, federal supplement, they're going to be spending it. They're going to be spending it on rent. They're going to be spending it on food, clothing, gasoline. Uh, so it, it's, if you continue it. That money goes back into an economy that is in, you know, everybody, almost everybody is predicting a serious, serious recession here. So anything you can do to stimulate the economy would presumably shorten that. Mm. Rebecca's calling from Coventry. Rebecca, you're on the show. What's been your experience? Hi. So I um, had to leave my job because they weren't using any PPE on April 2nd. I've been trying to apply for unemployment ever since. Finally, I, you know, got to speak to someone who works there who actually was making calls and helping people on his own time because there's no active phone number. So all I needed to do was reset my password, but it took me 12 weeks to do that. And I'm still waiting for the claim to be processed. 
Wow. And so how have you been able to uh, pay your bills, Rebecca? Um, well, luckily, my boyfriend is still working, and so we're okay. But it's still just been very frustrating and, you know, to not work. So I'm not destitute. But, um, you know, if I were 10 years ago, I would have been a single mom with a house. And I, it mm-hmm. would have been really, really bad. So I just think there should have been some phone number or somewhere that people could call to, you know, fix these small problems. It was a very small problem, but I just could not get into the system. Mm. Well, we've also been hearing that, Rebecca, and we thank you for calling in uh, to let us know uh, what your experience has been trying to even file for unemployment. Uh, Greg, at the height of this pandemic, what was it, more than 600,000 Connecticut residents have applied for unemployment? Yeah, and the uh, State Department of Labor was completely unprepared for that volume of of, uh, applications for unemployment compensation. Um, It's something that hasn't been seen since uh, since the Great Depression. Um, So you have this overwhelming need and a system that was out of date and just not prepared for this kind of uh, economic downturn. Uh, And so so they're getting it back and they've they've switched their uh, computerization practices. They've gotten more people on the job. But you hear it over and over again, especially in the last couple of months of how many people couldn't get through on the phone lines, couldn't get what they uh, really needed. Um, One of the things the caller mentioned that, you know, it, it. it would have been a disaster if she didn't have somebody else to help her out with this. There are a lot of single parents out there who are facing that exact situation. Um, Low-income workers laid off or uh, couldn't go back to work. Um, One of the things that uh, Stephen Lance at UConn said is that we have to keep in mind a lot of these jobs may not come back, that the... uh, that the businesses that furloughed workers or laid off workers uh, to save money as as their sales and and revenues dropped uh, may decide that, well, we don't need to bring everybody back. And so you're going to have some long-term unemployment impacts here, at least uh, uh, economists like Lanza uh, believe, which makes federal support and state support uh, for unemployed people uh, even more important at this point. Mm -hmm. A data Haven tweeted saying that a failure to act on COVID relief may exacerbate existing racial inequities, citing that since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in March, uh, more than six out of 10 Latinos and about half of black and Asian households in Connecticut have experienced a loss of employment income. Uh, Greg, as I mentioned, this federal supplemental benefit will expire at the end of July. This is also coming at a time where we're hearing from housing advocates and others that protections against uh, moratorium on on evictions, uh, the fact that a lot of people, if they lose this benefit, we're going to see a bigger crisis uh, possibly in the future because people won't be able to pay their rent or even make their mortgage payments. Yeah, there's a big fear that there's going to be a wave of evictions. Um, uh, At some point here, the governor's uh, prohibition uh, on uh, being evicted if you can't pay your rent is going to expire. Um, His uh, uh, executive order authority, I think, uh, is over with in, in September. So uh, that is a huge concern because it, it has, it's going to have uh, this, I, I don't know if it's a trickle effect. I think it's more like a, a wave. Mm-hmm. If you have thousands of people be, unable to pay their rent and being evicted, that isn't, that's going to affect all kinds of things. Uh, homeless shelters are likely to be overwhelmed. Um, food banks, which are already seeing, you know, hundreds and thousands of people lined up, they're going to be even more stressed. Um, The people who are renters, the people who are landlords, are also going to be put into heavy financial uh, trouble if if their tenants are unable to pay those rents. So you you have these chain reaction situations when something like this happens. And, uh, that's one of the reasons why the, a lot of economists are predicting the, that the recession is going to get worse, not better, mm-hmm. at least in the, in the near term. You're hearing Greg Ladke again on Where We Live. He's a reporter for the Connecticut Mirror. We'll tweet out links to his story and the work of his colleagues at Where We Live. Greg, thank you for joining us today.
Thanks, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Coming up, we hear what Connecticut employers are experiencing as the economy reopens. And we talk with a researcher from the Brookings Institution about whether the unemployment insurance program will slow down the recovery. You can join the conversation, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live from Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. In late March, Congress passed the CARES Act, which included a generous package to bolster unemployment insurance benefits by expanding eligibility for workers and providing an extra $600 a week supplement. But that supplemental benefit will expire at the end of July. And as we heard from Connecticut Mirror reporter Greg Gladkey, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont agrees with others, including congressional Republicans, that the extra federal benefit should not be extended. What do you think? You can join our conversation. 888-720-9677 or find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. We wanted to dig more into how unemployment the unemployment insurance program actually works before the pandemic and the changes that uh, came about during uh, this public health crisis. So joining us now on the phone is Mark Soicher. He's Human Resource Counsel for the Connecticut Business and Industry Association, also known as CBIA. Mark, welcome back to the show. Good morning, Lucy. Thank you. Also joining on Zoom is Annalise Goger. She's a fellow at the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program. Annalise, welcome to where we live. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So I'll start with you, Mark. Remind us of how unemployment insurance works under normal times. Well, in in, in normal times, uh, workers would file for benefits and uh, a determination would be made rather quickly uh, whether or not they're eligible for benefits and uh, typically, someone filing would receive somewhere in the neighborhood of about 50% of what their historical weekly income had been, up to a maximum amount of $649 a week. So anyone making uh, more than 11.98 per week or about 67.5 per year, uh, any any earnings under that would get about half payback in unemployment benefits. Above that, they would cap out at the the 6.49, and it. it not intended to be a uh, sustaining wage to allow someone to continue to survive at that rate, but simply to, to assist them un- until their, their next job came along. Um, and, and I think the system, you know, while it had its faults, uh, it chugged along uh, reliably. Uh, but, uh, you know, given the volume of uh, claims that, that arose with uh, the pandemic, um, you know, I don't think anybody could have set up a system that could handle that volume uh, in an efficient manner. And again, this money just doesn't come out of the drop out of the sky. So the money for unemployment insurance in particular states, it's coming from employers. And again, if eligible employees are laid off or they're unable to work, they can apply. But during the pandemic, the eligibility for this this program was extended. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, typically unemployment's awarded, uh, historically awarded to people who are out of work through no fault of their own, uh, laid off due to a lack of work or some minor form of uh, job uh, misperformance, misconduct, but but not deliberate misconduct. Uh, and and uh, determinations are made uh, whether or not someone's eligible or not. And a hearing might be held uh, to evaluate that. And the system had moved more to telephone hearings uh, to make it more efficient. And when a worker is awarded benefits, those benefit payments are allocated to the employer they worked for going back historic to, to a period of time, approximately five calendar quarters back. And the employer they worked for previously would be charged with those benefit payments and as a result would pay higher unemployment taxes into the system uh, to replace the benefit dollars that were being paid out. Uh, so it, 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 in, in theory, it's a dollar in, dollar out system. Uh, in reality, it is... Uh, uh, those employers that never laid anybody off would still be paying some minimum amount to mm-hmm. fund the system. And employers who created uh, uh, or triggered a substantial amount of layoffs uh, never fully replaced the dollars they were putting in. So um, it, it moved along with, with a delicate balance and uh, a trust fund that the state oversee, oversees. Uh, and uh, making those decisions about eligibility is intended to preserve the integrity of the fund and only pay out benefits to those who are eligible. 
Mm. With the CARES Act, uh, a lot of the eligibility criteria were set aside, and, and many, many more people were getting benefits, and deservedly so. Uh, because uh, it wasn't a situation where they could hold to those tight eligibility criteria. Mm. When you mentioned many more people getting these benefits, uh, I believe uh, eligibility was extended to the self-employed. And uh, when we talk about a public health crisis, I mean, that's the point to uh, keep workers um, able to uh, pay their bills, but keep many of them at home uh, during this, the height of this public health crisis. That's that's correct. Uh, The the, the fundamental criteria for eligibility has always been uh, someone has to be able and available for work. Uh, And in many cases, people with with COVID-19 health concerns were not available to come to work. So uh, they were uh, being awarded benefits and also uh, uh, self-employed sole proprietors uh, have not been eligible for unemployment in in part because Mm -hmm. they're not paying unemployment taxes on their wages back into the system. And um, it, it, it led to some practical difficulties. If someone was self-employed, they otherwise could lay themselves off for a two-week vacation and draw unemployment benefits when, in fact, there's really work available. They're capable of working. They've just chosen not to work at that time. But during the pandemic, uh, even those people's uh, businesses and uh, ability to earn a living has been stifled. And so uh, the system has been uh, expanded to provide benefits. They They were provided benefits in, I'll use the term, in a second wave of sorts uh, with substantial delay in in getting uh, the system up and running for Mm -hmm. them. Uh, But ultimately, I believe that uh, they they have moved forward in processing their claims as well. Mm. You mentioned significant delays. Uh, Paul writes to us, my husband, an arts educator, saw his income vaporize 15 weeks ago. Navigating the state system is a nightmare and there has been no one to help him. Phones unanswered, no help. 15 weeks. Uh, That's certainly frustrating for people, uh, again, who are out of work and need to have a lifeline to to pay uh, their bills, uh, to even get food on the table, uh, Mark. Uh, When we talk about the the state unemployment insurance fund and how the Department of Labor Labor administers uh, the checks uh, to people, uh, because of the height of the pandemic, so many people applying, there have been significant delays. But can you talk more about how the federal government uh, works with the state? with these unemployment compensation funds to help them also stay solvent? Well, uh, I I think uh, the federal government does provide some funding for the operational side of uh, unemployment. And uh, with the CARES Act, uh, what came about was normally the state is administering the fund, charging employers uh, higher taxes to put money back into the fund. Uh, Governor Lamont, in one of the early executive orders, had indicated that COVID-related unemployment claims would not be charged back to the what's called the base period employer, mm-hmm. per, the business the person used to work for, uh, simply because it would have such a devastating impact on employers' costs going forward if all of the benefit payments were being taxed back to employers. They would all be at the maximum tax rate. Um, but that that means the money's got to come from somewhere. And um, the uh, some of the CARES Act money, the $600 a week that uh, has been added to uh, unemployment recipients is being fully funded by the federal government. Uh, there's another program called the Shared Work Program, which is also being funded fully uh, by the federal government uh, so that employers won't be hit with that. At the same time, they're, they're printing money in Washington. Uh, at some point, uh, someone someone's got to put money back in the bank account to fund all of that. And then the state is is looking at uh, significant deficits in its unemployment trust fund for the basic unemployment benefits that people are receiving. And uh, legislature is going to come back uh, in the future and remains to be seen uh, whether taxes are going to be raised, special assessments for a period of time, a variety of mechanisms. I know Governor Lamont in in the press conference had uh, suggested rather than uh, receiving the funding to uh, enhance unemployment benefits, the feds should simply uh, give grants rather than loans to states to replenish the trust funds as a way of uh, replenishing those uh, accounts to, to continue to pay benefits without having the, the blowback on, on the employer community that fully funds uh, those benefit mm-hmm. programs. 
You're hearing Mark Seutcher on Where We Live. He's a Human Resource Counsel for the Connecticut Business and Industry Association as we learn more about unemployment insurance and how it, the program has changed because we're in a pandemic. You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. I wanted to bring in uh, Annalise Goger into the conversation. Again, a fellow at the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program. She's joining us on Zoom. Zoom today. So Annalisa, talk a little bit about um, the report that you and your uh, co-authors worked on looking at uh, the federal unemployment benefit under the CARES Act. And uh, again, pegging this back to statements from politicians like our Connecticut Governor Lamont, that they believe that this extra benefit isn't necessary uh, moving forward. Uh, What are some of your thoughts? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, most of what Mark just shared um, is is very true. But I think um, there are two things that I want to point out that we tried to address in in, um, our piece, which is one that it's not just self-employed that um, were expanded for whom benefits were expanded um, under the CARES Act, but also people who didn't meet the income thresholds of regular unemployment insurance. So before the pandemic, if you're a tipped worker in particular, you know, you wouldn't, your wages wouldn't fully be reported. So your income would be reported as quite low. And under regular unemployment insurance, a lot of those workers with very low incomes would not qualify or workers who are, you know, let's say you're, uh, you're working part time because you're raising a child you're, you may not qualify because you don't meet your state's um, income threshold. So I, I just wanted to point out that these expansions, um, because the pandemic hit, you know, restaurant workers and uh, people with very low uh, incomes, in some cases, janitors, um, you know, they normally wouldn't qualify for unemployment insurance. Um, and the program that the pandemic unemployment assistance program that was created under the pandemic uh, under the CARES Act is supposed to last uh, through the end of the year currently, um, but the $600 extra flat rate only lasts until July, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I think that's one point I want to emphasize is it's not just self-employed. Um, the other point I want to emphasize is that, you know, because of what he, uh, what Mark described as the UI trust fund issues, after the Great Recession, um, states were facing huge insolvency problems in their UI trust funds. And what they did in many cases um, to be able to replace that money more quickly and more readily was they started to make those income thresholds higher, to reduce the duration of benefits, um, to reduce the benefit levels. So every state, um, you know, for the last 35 years, these state systems are all very, very different from each other. Um, so every state uses its own unique formula to determine, you know, who qualifies and what amount they qualify for. They don't even have a similar structure. So in a pandemic, it actually becomes really difficult um, for lawmakers at a federal level to say, oh, well, let's let's raise it to, you know, 80 percent instead of 40 percent, which is the average of previous wages. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, that's hard to do because you're, they're working oftentimes with, you know, 30 year old data systems that use COBOL programming languages and, and things like that. So, you know, the, the, I, I want to highlight that one of the reasons why people like Rebecca, you know, had a hard time getting benefits quickly or if you're self-employed, why it took so long for states to adjust to those law changes is because for 35 years, we we have these like very different programs and you can't easily just implement a change the same way in different states. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's one of the issues when people are talking about let's, whether we extend to, you know, the $600 or if we have a proposal where we have a more complicated formula where it's a percentage of previous wages. um, I think we have to think about those delays that people have experienced when we're deciding between these options and make sure that, uh, whatever solution we propose um, isn't going to have states, you know, that are still struggling to deal with backlogs, uh, get relief out quickly to people. Um, and I'm af- I'm afraid that you know some of the things we're considering are are quite beyond the capacity of states to respond to. So those are just mm-hmm. a few things I'd like to highlight um, that benefits have gotten. Um, less generous uh, before the pandemic since the Great Recession. Um, 
fewer people qualified and also that you know because very low income workers are affected by this pandemic we can't uh you know forget that that, that they're covered under this new program mm-hmm. now annalise we're talking with you as connecticut has begun its phase two uh, reopening just the other week uh, other states have uh, reopened their economies and so the question uh, that critics raise about whether this federal benefit should be extended past july 31st uh, you know they're saying that the jobs have come back and some of these uh, workers uh, they're getting uh, more than 100 percent of their wages replaced because of that extra six hundred dollars Uh, In a way, does this slow down our recovery? What did you and your co-authors find when you did your research? Right, right. Well, I think there's been too much focus on this old trope um, that, you know, that workers are just lazy and they don't want to come back to work. Um, I think we need to really step back and realize we're in a pandemic and um, the way that UI works is if your if your employer lays you off and then calls you back, and if you refuse to go back, typically uh, you lose your benefits um, uh, if you don't go back to work. Um, you can't continue to collect. Um, however, under the CARES Act, because of the pandemic, uh, so not because of the high benefit levels, but because of the pandemic. You know, if you have children home from school that you're the sole provider for, um, or if you have a health condition like diabetes um, that puts you at very high risk and your doctor says, you know, I advise you to quarantine because, you know, you should not be out there having regular contact with people, um, then you can qualify for unemployment insurance. You don't necessarily have to be laid off. So, um, you know, I really think that... um, the biggest reason that people are not <clears throat> eager to go back to work or not able to go back to work is probably because of the pandemic and its impacts on people in terms of child care or health risk or even having an unsafe workplace. And and not so much that, that we can fall back on sort of these old mindsets as just people are just lazy and they're getting more money. Um, because if it, it is your old employer, you technically can't just simply say no and, and continue receiving benefits. Um, I think it's true that a lot of employers um, are having difficulty getting people back to work. It's just that it's more because of the pandemic and not because Mm -hmm. uh, we have these these high Mm -hmm. benefit levels. Well, I wanted to get Mark Soitcher to respond. Again, he's HR counsel for CBIA. What are you hearing from Connecticut employers? And what's your response to Annalise's, uh, what she had just said? I've been hearing from a lot of employers that they have had difficulty getting workers to return. Um, And I I think that um, it's a variety of reasons. The uh, child care issues, uh, individual workers' own health concerns or or the health concerns of a family member or someone else they reside with, uh, which uh, does present uh, a very valid reason why they might not be uh, returning to work. Uh, the, those issues have been addressed through, uh, at least uh, for the time being, uh, some guidance from the Connecticut Labor Department uh, to allow workers to decline what otherwise would be a suitable job offer, remain at home, and, and still receive unemployment benefits. And I, I don't generally hear from employers complaining about those types of situations. I do hear from employers who are uh, describing conversations they've had when they've called a worker to come back to work and the worker says, hey, call me in August when the 600 runs out uh, because uh, I'm making better, um, I'm better off now with this. Or there's some some other comment, maybe not as explicit, but suggesting that uh, the arithmetic just works out better in the worker's favor to remain at home. Now, I I don't want to suggest that that's a majority of the cases where employers are having difficulty getting people back to work. Um, I, I think employers are frustrated as business starts to pick up and the economy is reopening and they see the opportunity there to pick up uh, the work again and and uh, they're encountering a variety of uh, obstacles to, to getting people to come back to work. But most of the employers I'm talking to are not expressing uh, disagreement with workers who say, I've got a seven-year-old mm-hmm. whose school is not open or a camp program has not uh, started up again, or uh, an elderly family member at home. Uh, employers generally are not challenging that. Um, as, as to um, 
workers who are declining an offer of suitable employment without good cause, uh, in concept, the system should suspend their benefits. Part of the problem is with the crush of work the Labor Department's been doing, the hearing process is uh, uh, is uh, just not not functioning as, as it should, not as uh, uh, rapidly. And a- as a result, I think there's a lag time oftentimes with uh, workers uh, continuing to receive unemployment benefits. An employer can file, and, and the Labor Department's issued some guidance on this, and I- I've given many employers advice on how to do this. Uh, the employer can submit a protest to the Labor Department indicating they've extended an offer to someone uh, and the person has turned it down. And the Labor Department will schedule a hearing to evaluate whether they have good cause to turn it down, such as a health-related reason, or that, as as one of the callers mentioned, uh, uh, an employer is not implementing appropriate safety procedures, and therefore the workplace is not a safe place, and therefore it's not suitable employment to return to. Um, but there's oftentimes several weeks delay uh, at a minimum before that hearing would be held, and benefits may be paid out during that time. Ultimately, if the person is deemed ineligible, uh, they, they may rule that there's an overpayment to benefits that either has to be repaid or simply recorded as a charge for repayment uh, in the future, or possibly the overpayment would be forgiven. Um, so uh, the reality sometimes is that the system is not capable of responding as rapidly and efficiently as it needs to. Uh, and as a result, money is bleeding out to recipients who otherwise uh, could and should be back at work in some cases. Um, uh, you know, So in, in, in a large sense, it works out, but on the individual level, um, there, there's, there's a lot of breakdowns like that. Um, and, you know, I, I'd also point out the uh, the number of people that have filed for benefits, well over 600,000. Uh, the state labor department said they've processed 97 percent. That sounds really good. But 3 percent of over 600,000 uh, is close to it's about 19,000 people. Uh, so there's a lot of folks who are getting lost in the system with their claims interrupted. They they are paid retroactively eventually. Uh, but uh, those delays uh, can can be devastating. I, I've placed calls to Labor Department officials to assist in, in a couple of cases to flag uh, someone who's gotten ground up in the system, and, and, and they do correct it. And sometimes it's a, uh, you know, a data entry error that, that should be corrected much more quickly. Mm, that's an important point. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. We're going to continue our discussion with, again with Mark Seutcher, Human Resource Counsel for the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. Uh, also with us on Zoom, Annalise Goger, who's a fellow at the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program. We'll talk more again about uh, the benefits uh, being extended to Connecticut workers and other Americans during this pandemic. And you can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up tomorrow, Pride Month's looking a little bit different this year. Traditionally, Pride is marked by big parades and celebrations, but social distancing and racial unrest means that celebrations won't look the same as they did in years past. Uh, Coming up tomorrow, we're going to talk to the LGBTQ community, and we want to hear from you that conversation on Tuesday. Now, it's clear unemployment insurance during the pandemic has helped many Americans pay their bills while they wait for the economy to reopen. But now the reopening is here. So should benefits like this extra $600 a week federal supplement uh, continue or should it end at the end of July? And what does that mean for Connecticut residents and other Americans who don't yet have a job to go back to? My guest today on Zoom, Annalise Goger, a fellow at the Brookings Institution, and on the phone, Mark Seutcher, a human resource counselor Council for the Connecticut Business and Industry Association. Uh, Annalise, I wanted to circle back and talk more about the workers uh, that are being helped by, again, unemployment insurance during the pandemic. When we think about how the role or description of what an essential worker is, how that has changed uh, during this public health crisis, uh, when we think about workers wanting to go back to work, uh, would it be uh, more of an enticement if we're talking about low-wage workers who are actually making a better wage and maybe even getting paid? Aid, a hazard pay because of the, the the nature of their work? Yeah, I mean, I think we should make a, t- a distinction between um, workers who are being asked to go back to work or go back into the office um, 
who um, who do or do not have one of these underlying health conditions or, mm -hmm. or do or not or do not live with someone who is at risk. Um, and, and, and so I think we need to, because it is a pandemic, you know, think very clearly about who, who should we ask to come back to work? Who is reasonable to ask to come back to work and who is not so that we can, you know, when we're developing, when we're answering questions like who should be, uh, receiving extended benefits past July and who, uh, should not be, we should make that distinction. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think we need to shift the discussion from, you know, like essential workers versus everyone else who can stay home or collect unemployment to, okay, we're, we're going to like, who do we ask to come back to work? And I think when we do that, it's, it's not so much that we're returning to normal, but we're, we're dealing with probably a year or two more of ongoing uncertainty and risk. So this is something that affects not just the workers, but also the business owners. So if you're a restaurant and you're you know, you're asking your workers to come back. If there is an outbreak, you know, you can't really like sacrifice the the safety standards because your business can also be harmed if there's an, an outbreak in your restaurant. And that's already started to happen in, in mm -hmm. places that are reopening. So I think we have to start to shift our mindset to this, um, not we're reopening to what we had before, but we're reopening in this ongoing period of uncertainty, which is going to be challenging for both workers and for employers. Mm -hmm. uh, when you say that, I'm thinking about how restaurants have had to shift and they may not even have all, all, need all of their staff back because of uh, physical distancing, because of uh, the fact that maybe demand isn't there yet. Customers don't feel comfortable coming back in, to dine. And so this idea that some of these jobs that um, were not available during the pandemic, they may not return even um, as we see cases uh, continuing to drop. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So economists from the University of Chicago estimated that 42% of workers will not see their jobs come back. And, you know, so there's, there's two things, you know, in the short run, if, if, if this is a short period, um, work employers should be thinking about solutions like shared work, which people mm -hmm. mentioned before. So rather than, you know, if there's another um, outbreak or a shutdown, if there's another wave, uh, locking everything down again, throwing all those millions of people back on unemployment systems that we all know have had really tremendous delays. But what, shared work is an op option for employers where they can, you know, up and adjust the hours up and down on a weekly basis um, and spread the hours across multiple employees. So that way they keep their workforce, uh, but then um, they don't have to necessarily bring them back full time. And then the worker keeps their benefits. So they, including until the end of July, the extra 600. So that's one thing as, as a flexible tool that we can consider uh, moving into the next year or two when it's uncertain. I think that's really important. And then the second is, you know, our systems that we have in place for helping workers get a new job. So when you're changing careers, you know, most of us get jobs through people we know. And so when we're changing to a different field, oftentimes we need more help and not just retraining and new skills, but also new networks and new ways of, um, you know, finding a good job, not just any job, but a pathway to a job that pays a living wage. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, you know, even though 69% of Americans do not have a bachelor's degree, we put about 372 billion just in public second post-secondary education alone, but we only put about 14 billion in employment and training plant programs. And among the core programs that operate in like our job centers, typically, it's only about 4 billion a year in normal circumstances. So uh, in that whole setup, you know, in the WIOA um, adult and dislocated worker programs in 2018, we only trained about 200, uh, 280,000 uh, workers for adult, dislocated worker and youth programs in that program. So if, if there are 18 million people, that's 42% of people who have not, who've claimed, you know, unemployment, mm -hmm. there are 18 million people and, and we're, we only have current capacity to retrain, you know, under, if we double that, we're only getting to half a million. So I just think that we need to start talking about how do we help people transition from, you know, being a restaurant worker mm -hmm. to something remote. Um, and, and I think we're just, we haven't even started those conversations and very, very little relief money has go, gone towards programs like that.
Mm, that's a good point. Uh, Mark Sorcher, uh, tell me more about your thoughts on how the state of Connecticut can think about investing in training programs for people who are going to have to shift because of uh, this pandemic. Well, and and I, I just say that I think Annalise raises some great points. Um, I, I I don't think it's a zero. It should be a zero sum game. If if we invest money in those programs, uh, we need to take it away from the, the basic unemployment benefit amounts. Um, but I, I I think conceptually, what I'm hearing is maybe a, a better targeting of the use of the unemployment benefit payments. Um, and and uh, in, in doing that, I, it, it won't be just the uh, complete uh, blank check type payment. Uh, Congress was uh, so uh, 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 pressed with the need for getting this money out, they just decided to do the across the board $600 to anyone getting unemployment benefits, any amount of unemployment benefits. So there were cases where people uh, either under partial unemployment or, or shared work program, uh, getting as little, the, the way it was phrased, if, if someone got $1 in unemployment benefits, they got another 600 in, in support under the CARES Act. Um, for some, that was a critically needed supplement. For others, it was a windfall. Mm-hmm. And I, I think some uh, more precise formula for calculating the amount people get in unemployment uh, so that they you don't have those cases where people are making uh, 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 more more if if they stay at home the shared work program um, i've spoken to many many employers about that and heard almost universally that it's a, a very well received and and fairly efficiently run program uh, that does allow preserving jobs and maximizing income by combining wages and a more uh, generous calculation of unemployment than is provided when someone is uh, just partially unemployed outside of the shared work program so those kinds of efforts uh, with more publicity, more administrative uh, support, can can really uh, more effectively supplement uh, the fluctuations in the amount of work and, and earnings. Um, research on which jobs are disappearing and which jobs are going to be expanding uh, would be critical. Uh, and then diverting money into those job retraining programs, uh, because uh, as Annalise pointed out, a lot of jobs uh, won't be coming back uh, because employers are operating at a lower level or in some cases a business just wasn't viable and so those individuals rather than pushing them into uh, some career path that's just a job uh, if they can uh, be targeted or steered towards uh, programs that that give them a lifelong uh, career path that that would be a, a lot more effective um, there's also uh, you know there's going to be a critical need uh, for child care support uh, schools are opening up more slowly, expanded hours maybe, so they can reduce uh, the number of students there. Uh, working parents, teachers, uh, employers are sensitive to that, uh, but they do need to, to work with their employees who have those needs at home and uh, can't expect uh, people to leave uh, minor children home alone. And, and so, again, you know, uh, assistance for child care uh, services uh, will be critical as well to uh, free workers up to, to come back to work. I want to thank Mark Switcher for joining us today here on Where We Live. Again, he's Human Resource Counsel for the Connecticut Business and Industry Association, also known as CBIA. Mark, thank you for your time. Thank you, Lucy. Also, thanks to Annalise Goger, again, a fellow at the Brookings Institution's Metropolitan Policy Program. We'll be sure to link to uh, the report that she co-authored looking at unemployment insurance uh, moving forward. Annalise, thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you, Lucy. It's a pleasure to be here. Today's show produced by Carmen Baskoff. Test Terrible is on the phones today. Our tech producer is Kat Pastor. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening.